thanks again. It's uh, fantastic to uh, be able to join you. I, I, I feel honored that we are able to talk about resilient housing because it's such an important issue right now with so many people being exposed to climate hazards. Here's a map indicating um, whatever climate hazard is relevant to each part of the US, whether it's a wildfire or a hurricane, this is all affecting our housing. Same thing with earthquakes. We, we, we've long known the um, impacts that earthquakes can have on housing in the US. So it's such an important, timely issue. And it's such a great opportunity for engineers to come together, right, to work on housing, right? Because everyone needs a, everyone needs a decent home. And so much more now that we, so many of us are staying home because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I really appreciate your attention to this issue. It's such a brilliant opportunity for engineers to solve a problem that benefits humanity. Because ultimately that's what engineering is, is about, right? Solving problems to benefit everyone, to make the world better. So I am thrilled to be an engineer and I congratulate all of you that are studying engineering um, for your fortitude in, in making that choice. You know, I think a lot of the engineering problems that are easy have already been solved. So what we have in front of us as engineers, as a community of engineers, are primarily the difficult things, the difficult topics. So it's a great opportunity. It's a great time to be an engineer, um, but there's a lot we need to do. <laughs> so how did it start with me? So this is a picture of um, taken after the 1964 uh, Niigata earthquake in Japan. And this was one of the first disasters um, where engineers, the engineering community, really paid attention and, and did research and tried to understand the effects of earthquakes on the built environment. So here you have a case of liquefaction, and that's what I studied uh, for my dissertation research at UC Berkeley. So it's a phenomenon that can happen in loose, saturated sand. So sand that is loosely compacted and saturated with water during earthquake shaking, uh, the soil matrix can lose strength because the so soil particles temporary, temporarily separate. And it acts more like a dense fluid rather than a soil. And it's difficult, um, or it's difficult for a dense fluid to support a building, right? So you have a phenomenon of uh, settlement and displacement of buildings, uh, which are built on this type of sand deposit. So fast forward 35 years, I, went, I was in grad school at UC Berkeley, and the industry had figured a lot out about liquefaction, had understood how this happens, had begun to understand how to prevent it from happening. And I, I was granted the opportunity to do some pretty fantastic research on how to prevent liquefaction from happening in an earthquake. So this is a full scale blast induced liquefaction test that we at, a, at a colleagues at UC Berkeley, UC San Diego, and some research institutes in Japan, Port and Airport Research Institutes did, where we put various different features in the ground and set off explosives to simulate an earthquake. And I'm gonna try and play the video here, see if you can see what's going on. So there's a sequence of explosions that are liquefying the ground. And what we are looking at cool to watch. So we were looking at how deep and how wide do we need to improve the ground below the structure so that settlement can be um, kept within an acceptable range. Because we always have to optimize our design, right? We are likely going to have buildings next door to buildings. And so we have limited space in which to operate. So if we can optimize the depth and lateral extent of ground improvement, we can minimize settlement. Because that, again, is what engineering is all about. It's about solving problems in a resource constrained environment. We're not going to have a green field, a, a, an open field to start with. So we have to work within our constraints. And I found this research so fascinating and so innovative. Well, not only because we got to go out, <laughs> um, we got to blow things up and see how, see what happened, 
but also we had to figure out how to optimize the design and optimize the cost for the circumstances uh, presented in front of us. So this is a beauty of engineering. How do we innovate? How do we use technology to solve a problem in a resource constrained environment? This was a lot of fun. I got to, I got to do some pretty fantastic research when I was a graduate student. But I remember thinking that it was just a little bit disconnected from people. I remember thinking, how is this directly impacting someone's life? So while I was in grad school, an earthquake happened in Gujarat, India, which killed about 20,000 people. Most people collapsed because of the collapse of an unreinforced masonry building. So we, we often say it's not the earthquake that kills people, it's the collapse of a poorly built building. I grew up outside of Chicago in a small town and worked for my dad as a bricklayer. That was my summer job in high school and college. My dad worked for 50 years owning a small business, building houses, and that was, and that was quite a lot of fun <laughs> to have a summer job like that where you could actually build a building or, or contribute to someone's home. So I thought to myself, well, maybe there's something that I can do to help. So I went to India on a Fulbright Fellowship after I finished my PhD to study and understand how was the reconstruction happening? Was it being done in a way um, in which the buildings would be able to withstand the next earthquake? And I, it was quite a learning experience because of course I thought as an engineer, you know, we can design buildings to withstand disasters, but there was a lot more to it, like, than, I, more to it than that when I got on the ground. So I visited an area of India that was hit by an earthquake in 1993. And this is about 2003, about 10 years later when I was there. And, I, and this was a house that was reconstructed by a contractor after that earthquake. And I met the family who lived there and I said, what is this back part of your structure? What do you use that for? And they said, well, that's where we sleep. And I said, why, why, do, you, why, do, you, why, why do you sleep out there? And they said it was because they didn't trust that the contractor who built their house had put enough cement in the con concrete. So they didn't believe the structure was safe. So that's our first S, safety. We, uh, our ultimate goal is to make sure people are living in safe homes. I also met these folks who are living in a geodesic dome house. And a geodesic, geodesic dome is great for an earthquake, right? Um, no corners to concentrate, con concentrate stresses. It's a great design for, um, for an earthquake. But when I talked to these folks and I asked them if they liked living in this home, they said it was difficult because of the lack of ventilation, poor lighting, difficulty dividing the in interior space, and overall they were not satisfied with the home. Meanwhile, the opportunity to work with those families and the local builders to build with the technology that was locally sustainable was missed. So these homeowners were not satisfied. I also found people implementing new, newer technologies, um, perhaps more environmentally sustainable technologies. This is a rammed earth construction project. Again, sounds great from an environmental standpoint, but the business model wasn't sustainable because when you talk to folks, they didn't want an earth house. They wanted reinforced concrete and masonry. Plus, there were issues with the seismic uh, stability of these homes as they regularly had cracks shortly after they were built. So this type of technology wasn't really sustainable in the local market. Then, but in Gujarat, the government had used a different approach. So they had offered homeowners that they could rebuild themselves according to certain standards. They could choose the architecture. They could choose the building materials as long as they followed the standards about reinforcement and seismic safety. And when I talked to those folks, they were very happy because they could decide the architecture. They could decide to have a covered porch to keep in the shade during the sunny days. They could decide in this case to have a rooftop area to keep their livestock. And generally, these houses were built in a way that was earthquake resistant. So this was quite a lesson because we can design earthquake resistant buildings, but it's a lot more than that. We have to get the architecture right. It has to be appropriate for the culture and climate. 
And it's much more effective if the homeowners are engaged and they are driving the process. So this is, a, this is one of my first lessons about how to become a great engineer is be curious, ask questions to your clients, use human-centered design, understand what really works for people in the local context, try to walk in their shoes as much as you can. And second, do something you really care about. You'll be a lot more passionate and commit more time for something that you really love. I have a background in housing construction, working for my dad, and this was just the natural thing for me to do, to start working on housing that's earthquake resilient. So I started Build Change 16 years ago. It's a nonprofit social enterprise that saves lives in earthquakes and windstorms by working with people to design and build and finance better housing. So far, about 500,000 people are living and learning in safer houses and schools because of our work. And we've been in about 24 countries with major operations in Colombia, Indonesia, Nepal, Philippines, uh, Dominica, and St. Martin. We've got about 100 employees worldwide. Most of them are nationals of the countries in which we work. And we've got a, a, few, a few employees here in the US. So for us, it's always been about overcoming these three barriers to adoption, money, technology, and people. And this is kind of the bricklayer's way of, of saying um, financial, technical, and social, which is, I think, a, a more academic way of saying it. But we know, and we've known from the start, that we've got to overcome all three barriers to adoption for resilient housing to become common. And I think this is true with almost any problem, especially any development problem. There's a technical aspect, there's a financial aspect, and there's a people side. And by people side, we mean someone's gonna want the building to be safe. Either the homeowner has to want it or a government official has to require uh, building code implementation. So my guess is that even if you're less interested in housing, you may be interested in looking at whatever problem you're looking at through this lens of money, technology, people. So on people, this is a, a woman called Xing Dian, who we worked with in China after the 2008 Wenchuan earthquake. When we met her, she had already started building her house out of masonry, confined masonry, but she had one wall that was going up out of plumb, like really not straight, and then she had a very large window and door. And we advised her to tear down the wall that was going up um, out of plumb and rebuild it over and then put reinforcement over her windows and doors. We didn't get any money, we just gave her advice, technical assistance, and she was able to get this done with her contractor. And so this is the kind of thing that Build Change does. We don't actually build buildings for people, but rather we empower people with knowledge and technology that they can use to change their futures. And she told us that after she did what she needed to do to her house, all of her neighbors wanted reinforcement around their windows and doors as well. So that's an example of why homeowners need to be in the driver's seat for this process. Now, we're mostly working with masonry buildings. We're working in informal neighborhoods and rural areas in emerging markets in Asia, Latin America, and Caribbean. And for the most part, people build out of confined masonry or partially reinforced, partially confined masonry. This is what we see around the world. It's not our choice. We choose to work with people to build better with whatever technology they are already using. So this is a load-bearing masonry building, which is confined by reinforced concrete tie columns and bond beams. This is an example that I'm showing now of poorly built confined masonry that was damaged and almost collapsed by the 2006 earthquake in Jogjakarta, Indonesia. But if we follow a, a set of simple rules, we can build confined masonry buildings well. So we follow, we design according to life safety. We follow the building codes in the countries where we're working. We're usually looking at both seismic and wind, um, but we're dealing with masonry, which is a difficult building material to deal with. And maybe that's where me being a, ge a geotech makes this a little bit easier because in my experience, a masonry wall performs a little bit more like a soil under cyclic loading. Um, so it's a tricky material to deal with. So we've done a lot of testing around the world in partnership with universities in Colombia, the Philippines, um, Indonesia, and Nepal, various different masonry in-plane testing, prism testing, 
compression testing and that sort of thing to validate some of the assumptions about the materials and the wall properties that we have and to look at retrofit solutions. So there's very solid structural engineering behind everything that build change does, but we do it with, with a prescriptive design as the goal. So we are regularly dealing with many, many buildings that are similar in their structural system. So how do we use rigorous structural engineering up front to come up with a set of prescriptive design rules that, that we can then automate and apply to multiple buildings. That's our goal. That's how we scale because according to the World Bank, 3 billion people will be living in substandard housing by 2030 at the rate we're going now. So we need to make structural engineering rigorous as well as efficient and scalable. All right, but people often ask me is, how does that work? I mean, aren't all buildings different? So I have a quiz for you. It's not really a quiz. I'm not expecting anyone to answer, but I want you to take a look at these three buildings and tell me if you can guess where they are located. They all look pretty similar. They're all concrete block, CMU, um, cellular, often hollow concrete block, masonry units with some confinement. You can see the vertical columns, um, missing ring beams, roofs that aren't tied down, they look pretty similar. So can you guess where they all are? I will give you the answer. The first one on the left is in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. The middle one is in Manila, Philippines, and the right-hand one is in Guatemala City. But they all look pretty much the same, don't they? So we should be able to apply similar retrofit techniques to all of these buildings across the world. We see them all over the world, and this is part of, part of the way we scale is looking at engineering solutions that can be applied across the world. All right, so other, other, other paths to becoming a great engineer. Um, another thing we've experimented with is using a variety of communication methods, but keeping it simple at the same time. So we're simplifying the engineering so that we can reach lots and lots of buildings. And we've done that in part by using different posters and resources and booklets to get the word out on safe construction. And we have to simplify the inputs, right? Because if we make things too complicated, the builders aren't going to, aren't going to do it. Yet at the same time, we have to um, emphasize the interventions that are going to make the most difference. So when we started working in Indonesia, Indonesia is very hot and the bricks are very porous. And so they tend to absorb the water out of the mortar. The mortar is the glue that sticks the bricks together before the cement has time to hydrate in that mortar and create a good bond. So here you can see how I can just lift that top brick off. There's no bond. So how are we gonna solve this problem? It's not something that you can really learn from a building code. So an easy thing to do, a simple thing to do, is to soak those bricks in water before we build the wall. Very simple, very straightforward, but makes a lot of difference. So how are we going to get that message out to the builders, though? Here's one way that we've, that we've used. This is a building site in Indonesia and a building. message from Build Change. Good afternoon. Have you soaked your bricks before laying them? So it's a simple text message reminder about good construction practices that we found effect as an effective way of communicating with builders about next steps and good practices. So here's another tip. Supporting local entrepreneurs and creating jobs is an excellent way of implementing engineering product projects We've worked with a network of uh, Haitian business men and women who produce uh, concrete blocks to improve the quality of those blocks, to increase sales, and to basically increase their margins so that they can build more wealth and hire more workers. We've trained over 300 of them, um, of these entrepreneurs who produce something like 13 million better uh, bricks at, blocks at this point. And again, but we've got to keep it simple 
in terms of messaging the general public about the difference between a, a good block and a poor quality one. So here's one of the techniques that we use in this Haiti. Is a system to test the block, not to test the block um, as precisely as an industrial machine, but it can allow a client or a block maker to test a block and see if it is a good block or a bad block. So um, it is a very simple system um, that we, we tested, we calibrated in order um, for the block makers to use it broadly. It's a very simple tool. It's kind of like, you know, back when we used to fly in airplanes, that cage that you have to put your bag in before you get on the plane plane to determine if it's too big. So this is what we're going for, something that simple that a consumer can understand how to tell the difference between a good block and a poor quality one. So we have to live and breathe equality as engineers, especially in this day and age. We have, to, we have strived over the years to create an environment where women thrive. This is a collage we put together um, for International Women's Day a few years ago. Um, we have our lead engineers, most of our lead engineers are women. Many of our construction trainers have been women over the years. We have found an enormous benefit and great wealth by wealth of, of impact by working with women homeowners. We have found over the years that women homeowners tend to prioritize safety a bit more um, than their male counterparts and they invest in better, safer construction. So one of the keys to our success over the years has been investing in women at all parts of our projects, from engineers through homeowners to borrowers of our lending programs, uh, as well as construction workers and, and construction supervisors. So that's a key um, to reaching scale, especially in a field like housing. So here's another tip. I, I wonder if this part of my talk is getting a little outdated because I'm going to talk about Harry Potter because there's a great scene in which um, Dumbledore and Harry Potter are talking and Professor Dumbledore is saying to Harry that he's going to have to make a choice between doing what's right and doing what's easy. And I think this is a little bit outdated because everyone's read Harry Potter years and years and years ago. But the point is engineers have the same choices in front of them on a regular basis, the choice between doing what's right and doing what's easy. This is a building built by a contractor in Aceh, Indonesia after the tsunami. And it's, even, if, even if you don't know much about masonry or concrete, you can tell this is pretty terrible, right? Um, the rebar is exposed over here, the columns are poured in segments, uh, they're not straight, the masonry is, is poor quality. So we have to be able to stand up for what's right. We supported a group of homeowners who were protesting about the quality of construction to the point at which um, they were successful in getting the contractor to tear down a few building, of these buildings and rebuild them. So there's a, still more of this out there. Um, there are buildings around the world that are vulnerable to earthquakes. And we, as an engineering community, still have an opportunity to speak out about these buildings and to provide retrofit solutions. There's a class of building, uh, multiple story apartment block building uh, built in the post-Soviet uh, Union era um, in uh, Central Asia, in the former Soviet Union, in the western part of China. It's a, un, uh, it's a low berry masonry building with precast concrete plank, plank, uh, floors and, and roofs. And this building collapses. It collapsed in 2019, just last year. In Albania, it collapsed in great numbers. In China, it collapsed in 1988. It collapsed in 1963. And so there's enough out there that the engineering community knows that this building is vulnerable. It's time for us to speak up about it and to support our government partners um, to um, strengthen or replace these buildings. So. It's, I want to talk about money and about the financial access part of this because I've spent a lot of time talking about technology, but let's talk about how much this costs, right? So here's, and I'm sure you can't read this. This is a summary of some of the retrofit projects we've done around the world. 
with how much they cost. How much does it cost to retrofit a home? And the costs vary, $1,000, $3,000, $8,000, $5,000, based on the context. Um, the cost per square meter, which may make more sense, also varies, $40, $80, $100. But generally speaking, this is much lower than replacement cost. So we're finding in our markets um, these retrofit costs that are between $40, $100 per square meter compared to a new construction cost, which can be between $200 and $300. This is a attractive solution that is cost effective. So in Nepal, after the 2015 earthquake, um, many buildings were collapsed and many were damaged and could be repaired or retrofitted. So we did a quick back of envelope calculation on how much it would cost to strengthen and repair these damaged buildings. You can see one on the left-hand side. We determined that to tear it down and replace it, it would cost about $20,000. The government was giving uh, subsidies for homeowners to uh, rebuild of only $2,000. That's 10% of what they needed. So we said, can we retrofit these buildings? So on the right-hand side, you see a retrofitted building that was retrofit for about that same amount of money. So here we have an opportunity to preserve the asset, to save the financial asset of the homeowner with a small investment, right? We can invest $2,000 in retrofitting this building that it would cost $20,000 to replace. So there's a financial argument to strengthening buildings, especially in these markets. All right, so in the Philippines, very similar work. So we started working there after Typhoon Yolanda and recently moved to Metro Manila. Now, for any of you who are from or have been to the Philippines, it's got just about every disaster, earthquakes, typhoons, volcanoes, you name it, it's present in the Philippines. And so there's a lot of awareness about the disaster uh, possibility there. But we went into the Philippines asking ourselves, would people actually take a loan to make their homes stronger before a disaster happens? We know how it works after disasters. We know what motivates people. But will we be able to convince someone to actually take a loan to improve their home? And it turns out the answer is yes. For a segment of the community that's living in informal housing, um, that has the opportunity to expand and grow their building, they will, there is a potential for folks to take a loan to improve their home. So you can see an example right here of the before and after. A family that we worked in in Manila that, in, that took a loan to improve their home and add a second story. We've learned some very important lessons here about how to make this work. And we've found that if we come in and say, well, your house is gonna collapse in the next earthquake, do you wanna retrofit it? We don't really get a very positive response, but if we come in with a message of growth, if you strengthen the ground floor, you can add a second story, which you might be able to rent out. It's a much easier sell. So we've learned um, that it's best to come in with a message of growth rather than a message of fear. And so we've done studies to look at what is the potential for the microfinance market in the Philippines, looking at how do we segment that and which existing stakeholders can serve these markets and can lend money to these homeowners. Um, and we've also looked at the business model for, um, is there an investment possibility uh, for investing in resilient housing? So you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute, this, I thought this was an engineering talk and she's talking about financing, <laughs> right? Well, becoming a great engineer also involves knowing how to build a business model or finding friends who do, right? Building a team. So there's so many elements to overcoming these challenges and these obstacles that we have to be able to build a team. We can't do this alone. There's so many ex levels of expertise that are needed to overcome the challenge. And building a team is also about building relationships, relationships with homeowners, relationships with private sector builders, with clients, with government, with partners. And we have to build demand, right? So we're trying to sell, in some ways, a better house and someone has to want it. So again, all three elements have to be overcome, the financial, the technical, and the people. So Colombia. Colombia has a, a very high percentage of people living in urban areas, which are high, which are high density. Housing has been built in some of these informal neighborhoods with very little building code enforcement. And so you often have two, three, four story uh, unreinforced or partially confined masonry that's vulnerable to earthquakes. So 
we started retrofitting buildings a couple of years ago, basically to prove it could be done. There's a great story, Lena Marcella on our website, or you can click, click through here. She, we interviewed her just a few months ago after the COVID pandemic started to understand how she was doing in her house that had already been retrofit. And, you know, I can show you drawings of what we've done to the house, the ring beams we've put in and the columns and the better walls and that sort of thing. But when you talk to her, she talks about feeling safe in her house uh, with the bars and the windows, a toilet and kitchen that functions properly, and an overall feeling of security. So we have learned over the years that we have to not only come in with a structural retrofit, but also recognize that we need to bundle in improvements that affect people's daily lives that make their lives better on a daily basis. And we come, when we come in with a bundled package like this and we address all of these concerns that create a better housing environment, then everyone wins. So we have to understand the financial situations and the incentives. And we also have to understand what really drives people to make change and what they need to have a better life on a daily basis. We have a partnership with the government of Columbia through the Casa Digna Vida Digna program. It's a nationwide program to improve 600,000 homes. Um, when this program was originally um, envisioned, it did not include urban housing and we have, and our partners have successfully advocated for it to include the upgrade of urban housing. And we are now supporting uh, the government of Colombia to roll that out at scale. So again, money, technology, people, we have to bring all of these together. I'm gonna to make one or two more remarks about technology before I wrap up here. So Dominica was hit by a hurricane in 2017 and is the pro in the process of rebuilding homes. We've worked with the government to launch an MIS to enable homeowners to participate in this process to receive approval to participate, to design a home, to prepare the construction documents, to build the house, and to finalize it. And again, you're thinking, oh, this is an engineering talk, isn't it? And she, now she's talking about software development. So we've been able to bring everything that's needed in order to make a program efficient into a, a system that will enable it to scale without, with limited manpower and woman power on the ground. So it's a great step forward in terms of automating a reconstruction process. We have also done things like created apps um, to inform people about better construction. We have design libraries available. Most of this is, a lot of this is on our website or through our uh, various different apps that we have. We now have apps that work in um, Indonesia, Nepal, the Philippines and elsewhere. Um, as I mentioned before, we have an automated retrofit design, design tool as well as systems that enable housing reconstruction and retrofitting to work at scale. So we've also um, incorporated AI in some of our programs. We've been able to use uh, machine learning um, to compare photos and evaluate whether buildings can be retrofit, do a quick go, no go without having to visit a construction site to um, now to reduce exposure to COVID, but before just to increase efficiency and to reach more people with better solutions. Um, like I mentioned, we've automated using uh, Revit and Dynamo scripts, the design process, so that we can have, um, we can apply the same rules to similar types of buildings and not have to unique design every building. Um, here's a link which you can click through later to a virtual reality experience of one of the homes that we retrofit in Nepal. You can walk in this building, you can go upstairs, you can look at the Revit model. It's a very cool way of looking at what we've done. It's not only cool from an engineering and technology standpoint, but it's also a way of continuing to engage a homeowner in a complex design process. Because again, going back to the beginning, we want the homeowners to make the decisions and lead. And with these technology innovations, which are necessary for scale, we don't want to make it so the homeowner is excluded. So we're looking at innovative ways in which we can enable the homeowners to continue to participate. So this link is in the slide deck if you want to click through it and check it out. Um, it's a neat thing to do. All right. So becoming a great engineer kind of involves bringing it all together, science, engineering, uh, business policy, 
relationship building, people, it all has to be part of it, which is why I'm really honored to give this lecture. I was reading about Dr. Wenk and what an incredible, um, what an incredible man. And what inspired me was this quote that I read, make about his goal to make engineers more aware of the social impacts of their engineering projects. So I think it's impossible to not do an engineering project that doesn't have a social impact. And so the more we can work together with social scientists, as well as bring in those social elements ourselves, build a team, build those bridges, I think the more successful we'll be as engineers in achieving our objective, which is problem solving for the benefit of humanity. So we are focusing on housing and we're doing that because there's such a huge need and there's such an opportunity to make a difference in so many lives in so many different ways, saving lives in disasters, solving the housing crisis, creating jobs, reducing risk, um, building the skills of construction workers. There's a need around the world. And like I said earlier, our friends at the World Bank tell us that there are three billion, that there will be three billion people living in substandard housing by 2030 if we don't act soon and now. But we can't address housing without talking about COVID, right? Because many people are staying at home and housing is now our place of work in some situations. It's places where people are going to school. It's a necessary place to recover from being ill. And so decent housing is even more important now. We have to discuss it in this context. This is an awareness campaign we've done in the Philippines that's linking both better construction for disasters as well as staying safe um, from COVID. We cannot talk about housing without talking about racial justice, especially in the US. We have to acknowledge um, that how much discrimination, redlining, um, zoning laws have affected equal access to housing in our own country. So we cannot talk about housing without addressing racial justice issues as well. And we certainly can't talk about housing without talking about climate change. We are about to launch an advocacy campaign as part of TED Countdown, which launches this Saturday, to advocate for housing to be part of the climate change agenda. It's pretty shocking that it really isn't part of the agenda. It is from an energy efficiency standpoint, but not so much on a disaster risk reduction standpoint. And with the number of people who have lost or been displaced from their homes from fires and hurricanes in the US, and the number of people predicted to be displaced, this is something that absolutely needs to be on the agenda. Because housing really is the ultimate protection for families. It meets our basic needs for sleep, for rest, for recovery from being sick for clean water, sanitation. It also provides protection, protection from earthquakes, wind, fire, heat, rain, flood, all of those things. It's also a source of growth. It's an asset, it's a workplace, it may be the place of a small business. It, is, it provides so many things to homeowners. So I really appreciate your attention and your, your engagement as engineers. Again, Engineers have the opportunity to change the world. We already are. We will continue to do that. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today um, and uh, your attention to this important issue of housing. So thank you so much. Yeah, we can transition to the questions.